on the Education Committee in Local 287. And I was editor of the paper for uh, something less than a year. And uh, after that, uh, Fred McMullen was uh, finished out my term, first year. And you, I believe, uh, became editor the following uh, year, maybe the middle of the year, in July or somewhere along there. And uh, I read the paper the other day that uh, John Wells uh, remained editor of the local newspaper for uh, approximately uh, 12 to 15 years. Stuff that uh, makes a sign of that. Now, Johnny, I know that uh, in addition to uh, editing the newspaper, that you also have held other various uh, positions and leadership in the uh, local labor movement. And I know that you, more than anyone else, have uh, branched out beyond uh, the uh, local and that you have involved the local and especially uh, your own talents uh, in a uh, creative way in the community in general, working with the uh, farmers and small business people as well as with labor. And I know that you. Uh, published and edited another newspaper called the Indiana Record Review for uh, several years. So uh, since we're taking this to go on uh, file at Ball State University as part of local history, I'm quite sure that uh, university professors and uh, future historians of uh, the labor movement or the monthly community are going to gain a great deal from your comments uh, here this evening. And of course, I appreciate your taking the time to come out and talk to us. Danny, I'm happy to have had a small part in the history of the U.S. Department of the Labor Movement in Indiana, and as far as it has gone, actually my first connection was, as you recall, writing an article for the Labor Division in the U.S.L. Editor. From that I became a reporter and then associate editor and then finally editor. But I suppose, actually, the thing that I feel the most grateful for is the fact that we were a little instrumental in bringing the labor movement from the field of isolation out into the community, community affairs. Perhaps this came about when my daughter had polio in 1951, and I wrote a story called Cause for Reflection. She was in isolation, and all we would do was to Look at her through the window and make sounds that she couldn't hear. And, uh, this had such a, an impression upon me that I wrote the story and the Polio Foundation picked it up. They said, When you have your next drive, by all means get a hold of this man. And our first uh, entry into community affairs came about when. We coined the phrase fight polio with CIO. And our education committee got down on the street corner and with buckets and tubs and made a collection of pretty close to two thousand dollars. And we involved the entire CIO in the next year's collection. After that, when the AFL CIO merged, it became fight polio with AFL CIO. For 15 years, we were a member of the board of the Polio Foundation and uh, collected somewhere about $4,000 or $45,000 in that time for uh, children who were affected with polio. This uh, brought us out of the field of isolation and made us realize that we had to grow with the community and not at its expense. Therefore, we have uh, just found new fields, entirely new fields, uh, in the great big realm of, of the world in which we live. And I'm sure that the whole community has been better because the labor has become involved in the effort. Thank, thank you, John. Now, I, uh, I'm not going to claim credit for discovering John Wells because John Wells has made a great uh, contribution to. Uh, social welfare movement for many years uh, before uh, uh, I met you, but uh, I do have the pleasure of uh, recalling that uh, I proposed your name uh, for editor of the Labor Division because I had worked with you for a few months and it occurred to me that you not only had the interest but the talent and the stamina and the skill and uh, the necessary uh, initiatives and the drive uh, to go out and do the job that needed to be done. And 
You uh, no doubt have a record here. You've been editor of uh, the Labor Beacon and uh, also uh, the other uh, newspaper, the Indiana Record Review, probably uh, longer than anyone in a comparable position in uh, the Midwest. And uh, let's first talk about Local 287, Johnny, and then I want you to go on and talk about uh, the um, labor farmer, small business, farmer labor small business, I guess, it's just an organization, right? But looking back uh, over the years, uh, I think you became editor uh, of the week in, uh, what, 53, 54, 53, probably, 53, yeah. Uh, looking back uh, at the history of Local 287 since 1953, what are some of the things that stand out in your mind as uh, highlights uh, or major achievements uh, of Local 287 here in Lansing? Oh, Danny, it would be hard to really pinpoint them. As I say, Local 287 was the foundation on which we base our efforts to become involved in community affairs. Um, since that time, I think that the fact that Local 287 has placed men on board of the entire community, the United Funds area has uh, meant a lot because it made us realize that what we gain at the bargaining table, and what we gain by negotiating, we must, uh, it is incumbent upon us to share with others. And I suppose that if I were to list really the outstanding uh, things of Local 287, that it helped and provided the nucleus and much of the manpower and much of the finances to organize other locals, uh, smaller locals and weaker locals, and to help them in their time to strike and in their time to meet when they were almost helpless. Now, is this just in Muncie or is it uh, throughout the state or yeah. throughout the third uh, or the 10th district? The 10th district or? Uh, well, I would say it's principally throughout the 10th district. Or Region 3 of the uh, UAW. Region, uh, region 3 of the UAW. Uh, Johnny, let's, uh, let me go back uh, and ask you another question now. Uh, you were editor of the paper. This has been your primary job, although of you've worn a lot of hats in the meantime. Uh, what do you see as the uh, philosophy? What, what, what were some of the guiding principles uh, that, that you tried to uh, use when you were editor of the Labor Beacon uh, during these many, many years? What do you see as the uh, legitimate concern and mission or objective uh, of Local 287 Labor Beacon? Danny, when I became editor of the Beacon, I coined the phrase, a better community, a better use, actually, through a better understanding. And what we tried to do in the Labor Beacon was to convey to the membership what the leadership had in mind and the program that the leadership had, and then to convey back to the leadership what the membership wanted. Sort of a in other words, a correlation, or well, a correlation of the whole program and the communication. Then, of course, uh, we coined that further, we carried that uh, phrase further, and it became a better community through a better understanding. And really, this has been the whole, the whole philosophy as far as I'm concerned. How many, uh, what's the circulation? How many uh, people receive the labor deep in each month? Do you remember? Well, when I was editor, we had, of course, uh, pretty close to 4,500 membership, they all received it. On top of that, I had another thousand people that I sent to all over the country. So what kind of people did you send? What the all kind of All centers to professors, to uh, colleges, to, uh, to anybody, anybody that I felt that I talked to, no matter where I was, or no matter uh, where any of the other members of the local were, when they were um, in conventions or any place else. They showed an interest in the labor vision and wanted to get our communication. We put them on the mail. We had better than a thousand. Uh, people other than local we sent them to all community leaders, to the business people in town. Uh, you, you, you see the uh, 
speak of this not only as an educational agency for the uh, membership, but also as uh, a medium by which you can convey your ideas and uh, the uh, things that labor is striving for to community leaders. Right. Outside the local community. That's right. Uh, for instance, Danny, when we had our strikes, we always felt that we were misunderstood. The labor movement was then misunderstood because the people didn't know what they were striking for. And we attempted to use the labor movement to lay out the issues, what we were striking for, the position that the company was taking, the position that the union was taking, and then during the strike, we put out special editions of the people and, made, and delivered them to every business place in Delaware County and Henry County also, or wherever we had membership, so that the community became cognizant of what we were fighting for and what we were striking for. Well, what, uh, what were some of the things that uh, were won by the uh, union leadership and membership uh, during these years? Now, now we've talked about uh, the local uh, labor uh, union being used as a nucleus for uh, uh, all educating or relating with uh, the other community uh, agencies, and I think this is a fine thing, and I want to uh, get back to that later. But within Local 287, what are some of the concrete achievements that you wrote stories about that you have to I think the main one, the most concrete uh, first achievement that I know of, was the insurance program. When was that done? That was in 1951. And I was so so uh, cognizant of the fact, because of the fact that in 1949, I, my wife, and my two daughters were in an automobile wreck, and nearly all of us were wiped out. I was laid up for six months. My insurance at Warner here then paid $16 a week for 13 weeks, and then it was gone. I had a hospital bill of $6,500. The insurance paid $103 on the $6,500 hospital bill. In 1950, we were negotiating a contract for insurance that brought us up to $37.50 a week, at least it was for insurance, plus practically half of the hospital bill. And then, as we progressed, in two different times, since that time, I have had serious illnesses in my family. In 1953, my daughter had polio, both arms, both legs, her back, and her neck. The hospital bills of $1,300 were all paid. In uh, 1954, or 1955, I was burned very seriously. I had hospital bills of about $1,700. All of those were paid. So I would say that just of my own, as, as using myself as an example, that the hospitalization and the insurance program, which is so much better now than it ever was, is one of the major things that uh, Local 287 has won for me and it's won for all the other members thereof. John, who pays uh, the premium? Is it uh, divided between the employee and the company or the company? Uh, bear an increasingly heavy proportion of the burden of the cost. Uh, the company bears all of the cost now. Is that right? Now, was this the case in 1951? When you in 1951, uh, I think we bore uh, half the cost. I think that's right. And it wasn't, it didn't amount to anything, hardly. So this is one of the so-called fringe benefits that uh, really is worth a great deal of, uh, of money or bread and butter to the uh, Union number. Right. Family. Not only bread and butter, Danny, but it, it goes deeper than that. It goes down to the spiritual things. I'm not sure. To the metal. Psychological security of knowing right. Right. that uh, you won't wind up going $6,000 if you kill or this sort of thing. It might interest you to know, Danny, that why this is so interesting and so concerned with, or why I'm so concerned about it is that we were supposed to have an automobile, we were supposed to have a, a vacation, my family and I. Immediately after we got there, before we take the vacation, uh, my daughter had polio. 
So then, later, my wife and I were finally taking our vacation out in Arizona, and uh, immediately after this, uh, this real insurance program came into effect, she got bursitis. The doctor gave her some medicine, some dolphin and tall straw, and to make a long story short, and put her to sleep. And she was taken to the hospital in, uh, in Williams, Arizona, just 70 miles from the Grand Canyon. And uh, 15 minutes longer, the doctor said she would have been dead. When I went to settle up the, in, with the hospital the next morning, she was there overnight and then released. And I could bring her back home. But it didn't dawn on me until then. So here I was. Two thousand miles away from home, but all the hospital bills paid. Well, that this is a, a wonderful thing. It would be. I uh, all right. Well, this was uh, certainly a, a very significant achievement, I would think, of the local union for uh, their membership. Uh, Johnny, would this come about without the labor union anyway? Would, uh, would this concession have been made by the company without the uh, pressure? I could say this, Johnny, by asking this question: How many? Uh, companies now are there who give this kind of benefit, give these kind of benefits without a labor union. Okay, no, I, would that say, I would say that there, uh, that the labor movement and the labor union are, is the only thing that can bring about this kind of a, a condition. And even those companies without a union, without a local union, are giving these kind of benefits many times to keep the union out. And may I say, too, in that respect, that some of those people who think that they are getting all the benefits of the local union without being a part of the union and think that they are smart by getting, negotiating with their, by their company just simply giving them pension and insurance and this kind of security really don't have it because any time the company wants to fire any of those people without a contract, they can do so. So they're really not as secure as they think they are. Does everyone have to belong to the union now that works uh, in the factory? No. We don't have to belong to the union, but we have to pay dues equal to what everybody else pays. There's, you're speaking primarily. Yeah, well, now, that's right. I'm speaking, I'm speaking of Warner Gear Local 287. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's always a question uh, regarding the freedom of the individual, uh, whether he should have to belong to a union if he doesn't want to belong to a union. Uh, the unions argue for it's not a closed shop where everyone has to be a member, at least a so-called union shop where everyone has to join after he has worked there for a period of time. Uh, which do you have? you have the union shop? We have a union shop to this degree, but we also have when the right to work bill came about, we have uh, we couldn't have the union shop. Well, may, I, may I ask you if you would be in favor of the union shop? Oh, both. definitely, definitely. Well, uh, you're also in favor of freedom. I know you well enough. I don't even have to ask you that. So, how do you uh, respond to the uh, newspaper editorials and uh, uh, the political? Uh, philosophy of people who say, well, uh, I believe in freedom, and I don't believe anyone ought to have to belong to a labor union. Uh, it ought to be uh, uh, an open shop. Uh, back in the 1920s, uh, the Chamber of Commerce ran ad. I don't know whether you're aware of this. Uh, the newspapers uh, around the country that Muncie is an open shop city, that no one has to belong to a labor union here. And when the local was being organized by uh, Mr. Simpson, who was uh, Vice President and also General Manager of Warner Gear would write letters to his employees and they were published in the public newspapers uh, pointing out that the only thing that uh, the uh, company was really concerned with was that uh, their uh, workers had the freedom of choice and uh, they insisted that uh, uh, there not be a union shop or there, there not be one exclusive bargaining agent for the people, that uh, every individual ought to have a right to join a union or not to join a union as he sees fit. Now, uh, most uh, labor people believe that uh, the individual ought not to have this right, and uh, they, uh, they explain their position. What's your position on that? Do you think that uh, all the people who work on the machine uh, at Warner Gear uh, ought to uh, join the union, pay dues, uh, if so far? 
Definitely, Danny. By the same token, that I think that everybody who lives in America ought to pay taxes and pay their share. I have freedom of choice. I have the freedom of going on a three-week paid vacation this year. I have, my, and my union brought this about. Next week, I will draw somewhere in the neighborhood of $170 vacation pay. I have that freedom to spend that as I please. And I know I wouldn't have had that had it not been for the union. I have the freedom of going home tonight, knowing that if my family, if my wife or I are taken to the hospital, that uh, sometimes to come out of the hospital is going to be paid. It, it's just simply a matter, uh, and that these people really, who are continually crying freedom, and continually crying, crying that I don't want compulsory unionism, are just simply selfish and really don't want to pay their fair share of the bill. All right. Now, I uh, was reading a book the other day on uh, Walter Ruth and UAW by a sociologist uh, and also uh, by a co-author who works on the assembly line uh, in the automobile factory in Detroit. So it's by the name of uh, Howe and Wick. And uh, they had made a poll uh, some uh, 12 years ago, the UAW members in Detroit. And uh, these members uh, indicated, and it, this was conducted by uh, a sociologist, and so it was just a, theoretically we'll have to assume that it was uh, professionally done and uh, statistically accurate. Uh, this uh, poll indicated that uh, in excess of 90% of the people working in the factory felt that they had benefited from the uh, labor union activity, the organization, and, uh, by the uh, uh, achievements of the local. They had profited just a few in cases you have. Uh, my question to you is, uh, how do you think this would compare with Warner Gear in the 1950s? First of all, do you think that a similar uh, response would have been forthcoming from uh, the workers of Warner Gear in the 1950s if we had asked them if they uh, felt that they had benefited from uh, the activities of local 287? Well, I'd say, Danny, it would go over the 90% over the mark. All right, now that leads into the next question, and that is, if this book was written uh, 12 years ago, uh, if this uh, same poll were taken today, would this still hold true? What I'm really driving at is, are the new people, the young people who are coming into the unions and coming into the factories now in the 1960s, who have uh, already inherited seniority rights, who have inherited uh, the retirement benefits and uh, the uh, unemployment compensation, uh, the uh, insurance program you were talking about, uh, uh, $10,000 a year uh, wage, uh, salary, and this sort of thing. All these benefits they have, are, are they uh, really aware? Do they believe as strongly as you do? And the people who back in the 30s and 40s uh, built the organization and uh, beat the bricks, as they say, in order to uh, gain these uh, concessions from the company or these for their employees. Uh, do the young people appreciate this? Do they understand it? Do they really believe it? I'm sorry to say, Danny, I would have to say no to that question. I don't think they do. I don't think they appreciate it. I don't think they understand it. I think there's been a lack of communication from the you know, in the top leadership clear down to the rank of file. Although there has been an effort to uh, the international union to get it down, it still has to trickle down because this kind of a program must be built uh, on a local, on a local foundation. And I fear that we have, uh, in the labor movement, from the top on down, I fear that some of us have stagnated to the point that we are trying to. Revive every political election, the Hoover era, and really don't bring it down to the, to the new rank and file in uh, clear and concise language of what he is benefiting from, of what, why he is enjoying. 
Well, I, I think that perhaps uh, all he would need to do would, to really bring this back up to par would be to do without a union for a little while. And I think that really when the, when the company overstepped its bounds, they had worn a gear. There do come times when the company begins to overstep its bounds and try to take away some of those things that the people have. It is we go through the shop like wildfire, but so we've got to do something about this. And I think that uh, when the chips are down, that those people will come through and will never uh, give up the freedom. Johnny, I, uh, as you know, have been uh, talking with some of the uh, fellows who found it the local, and, and there aren't too many of them still living. Many of them have been either died or have retired and uh, moved to other parts of the country, namely California, Florida, former climate. But uh, I've talked with perhaps uh, a dozen or maybe 15, and uh, there are several things that uh, stand out about these people, but uh, it's uh, really remarkable uh, the kind of camaraderie that prevails, the kind of fellowship, the kind of brotherhood, if you will, and the kind of respect these fellows have for one another, and uh, when they speak about their deceased uh, former uh, labor union colleagues, whether these people may very well have not belonged to the same political faction, they may have been with them or against them when they were running for local office. And many of them, of course, were... They respected uh, their ability. They did, and many of them, of course, uh, were opponents in various elections. Some of them belonged to one party. I know, for example, two of them ran against one another uh, on separate parties for state representatives. Uh, but these people all speak uh, with uh, profound uh, respect and dignity and genuine fellow feeling. And I could almost use the term love, I think, for their fellow human beings to help them build this organization. And uh, they felt it was a fraternal. It was almost, a, it had almost, I think, a religious or quasi-religious connotation to these people. It was really a sort of thing that, uh, that I think the Knights of Labor must have It was a missionary fervor. It was a common missionary fervor that these people felt, and it still has left an impression, even now when they're in their 60s and 70s. Uh, is there anything like this prevailing among the leadership of Local 287 in 1969, 1968, No particular individuals, but just in general. In general, Danny, I think that it is really lacking that old time fervor because there hasn't been the the blood and thunder and the missionary zeal to get out and have an old-fashioned union revival to pull the people together. There hasn't really been a common goal and a common cause to pull all of the leadership together and say, one for all and all for one, and we must forget our differences, we must forget our uh, likes and dislikes, and all work for the common good. I think that it could come about. But I can't see it as of right now because of that particular uh, a lack of a of a goal, of a cause. They've forgotten the cause, really. I may say it this way. I think the entire problem with the labor movement is the full belly and an empty head. Right now. At least the full belly. Uh, I yes. suspect the head is probably uh, full, but maybe not the right thing. It's mm -hmm. desirable. Uh, well, I have many other things I'd like to talk with you about. Let me ask you, uh, before we uh, go to the uh, Farmer Labor Small Business Organization, uh, if there are other stories that uh, stand out in your mind that you wrote for Labor Deacon when you were editor for long years. Another one, Danny, is the 1957 Depression. Of course, the Eisenhower administration called it the Plateau. But here in Muncie, we had better than 12.5% unemployment. Good morning, dear. At, yes, it, yes, we were more than that. We had, uh, at Warner Gear, we had approximately 1,500 laid off out of uh, 3,500. But there was an average, 4,500, yes, but there was an average of 12.5% uh, of unemployment. 
in the Tri County area. And people were really going hungry, really in need. And one of my colleagues, John Garrett, and I got together and we approached the Delaware County Council about a surplus food program. And they didn't think they knew what we were talking about, so they gave us full authority to go ahead. Actually, we just took off to Indianapolis. And the first thing you know, we had everything. By the way, all of this came about because of the union, the summer school. I had heard about the surplus food program in summer school, so it's on here. Anyway, we came back, we knocked some heads together, and we finally got the Republican Township trustee, Earl Harder, with a Democrat mayor, Arthur Tewitt, with Democrat city councilman, and with Dr. Everett Farrell, who was a councilman too, all in a meeting up at the mayor's office, and we laid out the program that we can get this amount of food in Delaware County if we had the wherewithal to do it. We had taken plans before that and made all arrangements with East Indiana Labor East Indiana Labor Center, which is of course a branch of Local 287. That we would have the space there for the distribution. We made arrangements with Trustee Harder that he could put it in his budget. There were ways of putting the amount in his budget. And finally, when we got to the meeting, the only thing was holding up, we didn't have the truck and the manpower to get the food from Indianapolis to Monday. And one of the city councilmen, he feels that we will supply the truck. And then within a period of 30 days, we had Delaware County in a surplus food program is only of its kind in the state of Indiana and all of the local, all of the areas that followed suit followed the example of money. For two years, we were the director of the surplus food program under a Republican township trustee who gave us full authority to do whatever we wanted to do. In that time, we set the precedent that local unions that were on strike were eligible for the food, we gave them the food, we gave them the food, we said, now what are you going to do about it? Because they came under the criteria of need. Well, who, we made, have, who made the decision? Now, you went to Indianapolis to see who? We went to Indianapolis to see the, the uh, school lunch program. We came under the school lunch program at that particular time. The federal government. So it would be the federal agent in charge of uh, the right. particular program. That's right. Do you remember who he was? Doesn't make you. No, I don't remember who he was. Doesn't make that a different but it doesn't make it. Um, that was 1957. That was 1957. Do you have a story on that in your uh, newspaper? In the newspaper, and we have the first year's report. Was that also on the public news in the uh, downtown newspaper? We have, yes. We had the, the, whole, the whole story is in the state Library, which we gave Dr. Farrell. The first one the story. 1957. 1957. Uh, or, all right, I, I can. And it that. is still going. It's still going. It is still going. The surplus now, I wonder uh, how many people uh, realize that Local 287 served as the uh, the spirit of this program, as uh, the dynamic leadership. Oh, I think a lot of people do realize that. I do. Yes. We had it at the labor center, and the newspapers covered it very, very uh, meticulously. We're giving credit then. Oh, definitely. For the the yes, and it's all in there in uh, in black and white with pictures and, and daily programs from the time of its inception until we left. So not only did uh, a large percentage of your own people who were uh, unemployed at the time benefit from this program, but also uh, since that time, other individuals laid off or uh, out of work because of the strike and the need. Uh, have also benefited. Right. You, right. you would have no way of, uh, I suppose, of uh, hazarding a guess as to uh, how many people may have benefited over the years from this program. Well, Danny, from Delaware County, since that time, the 11 striking local unions of DBDA of Eastern Indiana that was Marion and, well, from Marion on clear to the Ohio line, 11 local unions plus a Copper Union, who was under IBEW, 
on strike making 12 to the tune of about 15,000 people. And we helped establish the surplus food program there immediately within a space of a week when they couldn't uh, get it any other way and we finally offered to help and through this, uh, through our efforts there, we were able to establish within a week in Jay, well in 15 counties of eastern Indiana, the surplus food program by these people who were on the strike. Johnny, you say uh, we administered that. Now, did you do it? Uh, you and the fellow who uh, came up with the idea that Local 287 and President, who was President Ken Boss at the time, yeah. was, was he the administrator? Uh, or uh, who was Charles? Uh, Kenny Boss was the administrator, was the president. Charlie Dawson was the president of Eastern Indiana Labor Day, uh, Labor Center. Which is an affiliate or a subsidiary of Local 287. Might I say this, that without the board of directors of Eastern Indiana and without Charlie Dawson's full support, we could never have done it. And without the full support of uh, Kenny Boggs, who was the president, and the executive board, because they were letting me, they negotiated with the company. They didn't negotiate with the company, they said he's going out. And for one month, one week, out of every month, for two solid years, I took off from the shop and run the food program. One week out of every month, the company was having fits, but Local 287 and the labor movement was getting all of the benefits of the good publicity because this was getting into the community and involving the entire community. The beautiful part of it, then, was that this kind of a program, you had literally thousands and thousands and thousands of people coming to the labor center every month of the world. And they were identifying labor with their need and identifying their need with labor. And these are the kind of things we think that uh, the union would ought to get more involved, far more involved. All right, uh, let me uh, ask you if you have any other uh, outstanding uh, uh, news story that comes to mind. And uh, if you do, why, uh, go ahead and tell us about that. And we'll move on into your community. Well, I think about it for a second if you want right. to. And uh, then we'll go on and talk with you about your uh, farmer, labor, and small business organization. Oh, yes, Danny. One thing that really uh, we forgot. Go right ahead. As a member of, uh, or as editor of the paper, and a member of the board of directors of the National Foundation locally here, we went to a report meeting of the foundation one January after the after the drive was all over. And there we had we met a little girl who had been used as the poster girl in the fall campaign for financing for raising funds. And I said to, said to the board, well, it's been a long time, or I haven't been so very active the last year or so in the foundation. The very least I can do is to write a story. Why not write a story about this little girl and, and uh, give the foundation some credit? They said, fine. Well, I went out to uh, meet the little girl and her mother and, and her father, and I come to find out that he was a man. And here was a little girl who had been born and lived for five years without ever walking. And then when I found in my perusal of the story, in my following the story through, I found that really the National Foundation hadn't done anything at all for her because she had had terrible palsy. And all they had done was just simply use her or the poster girl because she was so apropos that they really hadn't even given a dime for any uh, physical therapy uh, treatments or anything like that. But really, the, I found this, that a local chiropractor had been asked for a contribution for the National Foundation. And he said, no, I won't give you any money, but if there are any of your children who need the, the kind of help that I can give, I'll be glad to treat you for nothing. 
And this was this one little girl who was given treatment and uh, adjusted. After five adjustments. Johnny, I didn't get the date on that. What, what year was that? This was in, oh man. It's in the labor It's in the labor beacon in the record review. Uh, and uh, I have those bars. You have those bars. Let, let me say it. But anyway, a local 287, I went I won't say that comment. <laughs> right. Go ahead, John. Anyway, I found this that the, the chiropractor had given her adjustments. In fact, five adjustments when the medical doctor said she would never walk in all of her life. She got up and walked. Well, that's really it. It really was. How old was she now? She was five years old. Oh. So then, from that story that I wrote in the beacon, and I wrote about this, and giving the chiropractor, the chiropractor all the credit to the local chiropractor, Dr. William Brown, the I hear monthly, giving him all the credit and giving chiropractors all the credit for that little girl walking. Then, Kentuckiana Children's Chiropractic Center in Louisville, Kentucky, said if you will get the little girl down here, we will send her through our clinic with all of these, with no expenses whatsoever, as far as our part is concerned. But she had to, her mother and the little girl had to live on the outside. I went to my local union, and they contributed the first $500 to take care of that little girl. We went down on the Kentucky Bridge, and we had Kentucky, Louisville, Louisville Kentucky, Union people and chiropractors in Indiana, Kentucky, Indiana chiropractors and union people meet down on that bridge, and we had some shaking hands with this little girl in the middle. We call this hands across the border. And the Kentucky Union became involved in it. The, uh, the cab company down there provided all the cabs. The Kentucky Union provided some of the uh, board and room. And the local unions up here, especially local 287, contributing the first $500, paid for all of, the, all of the time that that little girl needed down there. But then we wrote another story in the Record Review and the Labor Beacon that had circulation of a quarter of a million all over the world. The Record Review on that story had a quarter of a million circulation all over the world. That's the only time I ever made a dime. <laughs> I'm not to get some money out of that. Uh, I had a couple of things I wanted to say. First, first of all, uh, Johnny, as an almost professional graduate student who's done postgraduate work uh, at uh, New York University and Southern Cal and Claremont and University of Miami and West Coast State, uh, and I must have written 50 papers. And uh, I would say in all sincerity that you have your material better organized than uh, any person that I've ever worked with. That includes uh, newspaper reporters and uh, 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 state uh, education uh, uh, regions and this sort of thing, and not to mention, of course, politicians. And uh, uh, it seems to me that you've done a fantastic job, the sort of thing that uh, uh, a student really is uh, extremely fortunate to find someone who has kept his uh, personal record as well organized as John Wells has. Extremely uh, uh, rare to find someone who is so meticulous, and uh, I think you're being commended for that. Thank you, know. you Danny. Uh, another thing that I wanted to ask you, and this goes into the farm labor, small business. Uh, a lot of uh, social scientists, theologians, and social sociologists, and social psychologists, uh, labor commentators are beginning to say now that. Uh, Labor's arrived, and really, uh, labor is reached the middle class you now. If you live in the suburbs and you have uh, two new automobiles and you send your sons and daughters to college and uh, you have a paid vacation and uh, you uh, take a shower and put on a white shirt and tie when you come home, and that you've arrived. And uh, because of this, there are uh, two questions to raise. Number one, does it mean that you are going to become uh, intellectually and philosophically and uh, I, I suppose economically complacent and static and uh, stagnant and conservative, as it were, and uh, lose an interest. This is the second part of it. Lose an interest in social reform for the still underprivileged uh, people and, and various other walks of life. Uh, the people who are unorganized uh, are the people who uh, have a different color skin or uh, different color uh, eyes or uh, belong to a minority groups of some kind or another. Uh, who are still struggling for the kind of economic and social justice that uh, 
Steve and Warnick were struggling for 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, what's labor prepared to do now? Anything at all to move in the direction of trying to promote social justice in other segments of society now that uh, Local 287 has a uh, fairly secure uh, contract worked out uh, for the company for their membership? Well, I think, Danny, this is the real uh, crux of the whole issue of whether we're going to survive or whether we're going to live or die. Because if we don't get, get involved, and if we do not branch out into helping the other fellow gain some of the good things of life that we ourselves have gained, already enjoy, we will dry up, we will be like the dead, and we will become useful. And I fear that we are too, too complacent as of now. Many of our fellows in the shop are following, well, they follow the George Wallace uh, theory, and they are following the ultra-right wing theory that I've got mine, you get yours the best way you can. Is it really a conscious thing? Do they really say, I've got mine, or do they just take it for granted that they do have it and they've always had it? They take it for granted that way. They're, they're taking it for granted. Even some of those who have gone through some of the hard things, they've gone through some of the organizing things. Just long ago they've forgotten about They've forgotten, right. And the only thing that they can look at, I, and I find it in the shop, the main thing they look at the paycheck is the sub as how much was taken out. Oh my God, look how much is taken out. Not how much they had left, but how much was taken out. And they say, well, it's just that it's harder for me to live now than it was 10 or 15 years ago. But they don't realize that 10 or 15 years ago, they weren't driving two cars on right. That's right. They didn't have color television. Right. And they didn't have a boat, and they didn't have a lake on the uh, cottage on the lake. And they didn't live in a suburb and a fifteen or $20,000 home. No, they didn't. No. Or $25,000 home. That's right. With the typical knowledge. So that's right. Johnny, I wish we could go on and on and on about this, but uh, you simply uh, uh, must tell me about uh, your uh, other organization that you have developed and uh, tell me how it got started, the uh, Farmer and Labor Small Business Organization. Now, you're president, is that right? Right. You've been president of this organization for how long? Well, since its inception. When was that? Actually, it started out, Danny. I often say this, say to all of my audiences, that no matter how thin you slice it, it comes out of politics. All right. It makes no difference what you're doing or what you say or what you negotiate or how you live, you still have to answer to the politics. Isn't that what Aristotle said, man's a political animal? Right. It came about when I ran for state representative uh, several years ago. I didn't I even know that you had run for state representative. I did, in 1954. Were you nominated by your party? No, I came in uh, third out of a field of six. I didn't win the nomination, but during my uh, campaigning, and I went all over this county, and they finally got to calling me Kilroy. The county chairman said, well, here's Kilroy, because everywhere I've been, he's already been there. But I made this approach to the farmer, don't you think it's about time that we in organized labor and we in the farm field stop blaming one another for all of our ills? and begin to approach one another for a better understanding, still following the theme of better community to a better understanding. And I uh, use this approach so much that even though in the, prior, in the spring I failed to win the nomination, the ball started rolling, and we had, in the fall, a, the first farm labor banquet, which we had 450 people. We invited the farmers to provide the first speaker. They had Leon Kaiserman, former economic advisor, Harry Truman. And he said, that, I'll never forget it, he said, I've spoken to many labor groups as such, and I've spoken to many farm groups as such, but this is the first time in my life I've ever addressed a farm labor group like this. Well, after three years, we 
said to the uh, members, don't you think it's about time we invited small business? Because really, small business doesn't have anybody to speak for. More of them as such. The Chamber of Commerce doesn't speak for small business. It's controlled by big business. Any more than the Farm Bureau speaks for the, for the farm. farm. Right. So they said yes. So therefore, we invited uh, small business people and made them equal partners. That's how it became farm labor small business. Johnny, how many members do you have now? We have uh, approximately 2,000 and oh, approximately five or six states. Scattered out over five or six states? Yes. And this is the uh, headquarters here. Right. Must be. Right. Uh-huh. Um, go ahead. We've had such outstanding speakers as W. Abel Harriman, former ambassador, who, uh, I believe, well, just ambassador. At large. At large, right. Uh, we've had uh, union speakers and small businessmen as speakers. We've had as high as 1,450 at our banquet. Johnny, what are your goals and objectives for this organization? Again, Danny, it is to develop a communication. We base our, our whole being on these three things. First, communication. If we learn to communicate, we are on the, well, we're at the, at the fundamental principle of making progress. Because before I can do anything at all, I have to communicate with you. And I coined the phrase, if you would have the under, other man understand your problem, you must first learn his language. Then, from communication comes consideration. I must consider your position. You must consider my position. I consider your aspiration. You consider mine. I consider your problem. You consider mine. So one of your major objectives has simply been the communication, the mutual understanding. That's right. And then the from theory. those two things comes cooperation. We bury in the background. Cooperation for what? Kind? On, on, uh, on programs Public policy. that will help us all a great a great amount of people to gain a better life, a better way of living. Now, now you publish uh, a newspaper as uh, president of this organization. Uh, are you dead for a while? The Indiana Record Review. The Indiana Record Review. I haven't had time to print it. To write it or publish it for quite some time. Now, but, okay, let, let me ask you this. What are, what are some of the things that you um, advocate in the newspaper? For example, do you support politicians running the public office? We feel this way as far as farm labor small business is concerned. It is not an affiliation of local unions or international unions or organizations or farm organizations. It is rather a coalition, an amalgamation of the people thereof. Therefore, we do not endorse candidates, although one time we did. But we are, it will be our policy not to endorse candidates. We invite the candidates of all parties to present their views when we get into a political campaign, to present their views and their ideas, and then we let the people make their own choice. This isn't to say that, this isn't to say that we don't make opposition for it. Now, Johnny, did you uh, endorse all candidates belonging to one party, or did you make split endorsements? Did you support, uh, did you just become an affiliate of the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, or did you select and choose the people that you thought would help you promote we selected, the welfare of the organization? We selected and chose, I see. And in that particular respect, we certainly got the ire of some of our labor colleagues who had done nothing to support Democrats. And we can say that we were fortunate in electing uh, uh, a couple of the Republicans who were who were our choice as far as the, the position was concerned. So they pretty much uh, support the positions that you take on public policy. They have, and we have been in position, Danny, by that by that role of actually helping the labor movement and getting some of the things across in the labor movement in the legislature that the labor movement wanted that they would never have gotten across without our help in this matter. I might say that our 
latest thing, and this is going to be the really the uh, the key of whether farm labor small business is going to survive and is going to be a dynamic power or a dynamic uh, movement. And that is this, that the farmers with whom we came in contact were those who principally were already uh, leaning to the, uh, the philosophy that the labor movement was leaning to, one of the farm organizations, namely the farmers union. Then the NFO, which is principally the founder the farm union or the farm organization dedicated to uh, trying to get something to collective bargaining as the labor movement has. Although we don't take them in as as particular members representing the NFO or the Farmers Union or the Farm Bureau. These people are inclined to join your organization. That's right. As members. Johnny, uh, the what, main, what does membership do? You have $5 a year. $5 a year. Uh, do you have an executive board? Yes. Do you have annual meetings? Yes. Uh, uh, who meeting. elects you? The total membership? The total membership. Uh, and is it we by mail or uh, we, No, by uh, an annual meeting here in Muncie. We also have five different chapters in Ohio and Indiana. Do you have how many people attending uh, membership meetings? Oh, okay. we can have, uh, oh, we'll have uh, all four or five hundred attending the annual All right. What are the other positions? I wouldn't be interrupting well, you trying to get this on, but we're going to close down the meeting. the president, the vice president, recording secretary, and financial and uh, treasurer, and then a 15-member board of directors representing uh, uh, all of them. All right, these are all elected by the membership. Yes. Let me ask you, um, well, do you, have, um, do you have more than one individual running for an office? Do you have competition for these? Oh, office? yes. Uh -huh. uh, all right, let me, let me ask you now uh, another question uh, on this. Uh, are the, uh, are the uh, representatives chosen by the people in a particular district? Or is it all at large? All at large. It's all at large. Although we try to balance it out to where there are uh, equal numbers from different districts and from... How many districts do you have? Well, we've got six... Oh, I don't know. But two out of Indiana and Ohio and uh, southern Michigan now, principally. What states are you in? You're in Indiana, Ohio, well, Michigan, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Illinois. Five states. With us mattering here and there of uh, at large from New York and California and uh, or other other places. But Danny, I I must get this in. Go ahead. Farmers have principally been independent. And they have principally been taught that the labor movement and union is uh, the cause of all their ills. But right now we have going for us up the, the issue to the people that here are some people who are just as hungry, who are just as thirsty, who are just as desirous of some of the good things of life that they have been denied, as you farmers who are going broke to the corporate farms and are bowing to the corporate farms. And we're talking about the migrant workers. We know that the UAW and the AFL-CIO are dedicated to helping the farmers, uh, the migrant workers get organized and the farm workers union. Now we have going for us, because we put it out to our farmers, if there was, comes a time, if there was ever a time that you have an opportunity to go back and pick up where you should have take, picked up 30 years ago with the organized labor, now is your opportunity to do so. And in Fort Wayne, just one month ago, we had a meeting in which we discussed this very thoroughly. And we came from that meeting with farmers and the migrant workers who are working on the family farm, talking about a coalition of joining together and working together and negotiating together for the benefits that will help both of them. 
And if anybody would ever have thought that this could ever come to pass, they would have been called uh, men kaboots and dreamers. So what but you have to do now is to watch it and see what develops from this stage on. We're not only going to watch it, Danny, we're going to encourage it. And promote it. Very good. Right. We're doing it uh, every... All right, this is one of the week. things then that you have. This is one, of, I, I assume, this is one of your major objectives in the months ahead and years yeah. ahead. Uh, very fine. If I ask you, uh, Johnny, do you know approximately what percentage of your membership you have? A thousand altogether? No. We have approximately two thousand. Oh, two thousand. Uh, approximately what percentage of these uh, are farmers? What percentage are union members? What percentage are small businessmen? Well, I would say that 90 percent to 85 percent of them are farmers. Uh, probably 12 percent are union people. And only 3 percent, I think that makes it 100 percent. Right. Our small business. They were the ones you brought in last. Yes. Union people are prone to be satisfied with what they have and not out in the evangelistic spirit. The farmers are the ones who are given to the union movement. We believe the kind of a missionary spirit that the union movement is going to have to get back into if we hope to survive. John, you're elected for one year. Right. Every year you right. run for re-election. In January. Uh, I see. What are your future plans uh, for the organization? Well, my future plans are actually to get this uh, farm labor organizing uh, together. John, I'm going to have to run, run, run out of tape. All right. Thank you very much, and it's been most interesting to me, and I'm sure it's going to be very uh, informative to the future historians of Muncie and 287 and of 